The shoes totally could have been Van Eyck's imagination, but where optics would have helped is with this incredible chandelier that's the size of my palm. But even though Van Eyck might have seen this projected upside down, optics don't make marks. He can do whatever he wants with that projected image. He can copy the features he wants, he can ignore the features he doesn't want, and he could have, and he did create this. They're not photographs, they're more complicated than that. So if we look at this famous artwork, if we want to analyze this work of art to decide was optics used, we better analyze features like this. If you blindly go in and, and don't understand, and you analyze this feature, you might incorrectly conclude that optics was not used in this composite painting. We need to look for the right things to look for. So if we take this Arnolfini marriage, one of the, the uh, signatures of the use of optics is, did he use optics to paint that um, mirror? If, his, if Van Eyck's lens was above or below that mirror, that mirror wouldn't have been round. It would have been oval. So if he used optics, the lens had to be at roughly that position. If we magnify that, We magnify that. Let's try that again. So if he used a lens, it's got to be somewhere around there, like here. Is the man in blue Van Eyck, and the curtain behind him his camera obscura, with the bright object his concave mirror? Well, if that camera obscura, the, the one that was actually in the film that I made, was actually made by my daughter, who's in the audience right now, who is an, uh, under his when she was in um, architecture school, she's now a New York architect, um, she made that camera obscura, which is actually more widely traveled than many of you. His next good trip is to Saudi Arabia, um, where I use this to demonstrate various things. That's what a camera obscura looks like. It's a piece of cloth. So people who have been misled, who haven't understood, who are looking for some object, a thing that looks like a camera, are looking for the wrong thing. You need to be looking for a curtain, which we know exists, and a concave mirror, which we know exists. So now with that as background, I'm going to show you very quickly evidence in two paintings. This is Lorenzo Lotto and a Robert Campan that's here at the Metropolitan Museum. So you can look for, at this uh, yourself. When I first visited David, he has organized on a wall that's the length of a tennis court in his studio in, in Los Angeles, color photocopies of all the paintings that look to him worth consideration. And he organized them like a scientist would organize things. Paintings from Northern Europe on the upper wall, Southern Europe on the lower wall, chronologically organized. This painting in particular caught my eye and kind of refer to this to as our Rosetta Zone. One feature that will be more apparent when I magnify it is that that central octagonal pattern goes out of focus. And I want you to remember there's a woman in the painting because she's going to be our molecular beam epitaxy machine. She's going to be our ruler. So if I magnify that center section, that goes out of focus. Well, it seems reasonable. Why not? If you've never seen a projected image, you've never seen this before. The human eye does not simultaneously see part of a scene in focus, part of a scene out of focus. Now, the reason why I say that this, uh, I'm emphasizing this, I mean, that looks like a perfectly reasonable photograph. That's not how you would have seen this. You would have looked at the boy's wine bottle, you would have looked back at the car, and your eye would have refocused, and you would have constructed a mental image of the scene that was totally in focus. So the fact that that octagonal pattern goes out of focus is very strong circumstantial evidence that that painter had seen a projected image 75 years before Galileo. If we look at vanishing lines, there's two sets of vanishing lines. And I'll show you in a second, there's a third set. If I put it back into the painting, it goes out of focus, I know, somewhere in here. If we look elsewhere, the same depth into the scene where the carpet goes out of focus, we see one set of vanishing lines, another set, and they differ by three degrees. And I won't talk about these other features in a second. Let's reproduce this. Every feature I'm going to show you, every, every bit of evidence, we've um, reproduced photographically. And I'm only show you this one example. If I take a picture of this, um, this particular scene, and I focus at the front of this carpet, and I paste together, this is only the bottom half of my photograph. And now what I do is I change my mind. I refocus to this point. And now I'm going to, with Photoshop, I've already painted this. 
I'm going to paint the top half of the scene after refocusing. Well, it looks fine, except if you look at it more carefully, you see that the ruler's not straight. It's kinked, and it's kinked by three degrees. Just like the, this. Another bit of evidence. Oops, sorry. Flip through this quickly. A mistake of it. So let's try to fit an octagonal pattern to this. If I take this octagonal pattern, correct for perspective, take away the ruler, have it in color, it's all done to scale, and if I put this on the painting, well, your first reaction should be, it doesn't fit at all. What are you trying to tell me? Optics is used. It doesn't fit at all. But this is not what Lorenzo Lotta would have seen because this is a very high magnification. He would have seen something like this. This is several depths of field into the scene. Make use of it. You're a clever artist. You want to capture this very real. You make the markings here where it's in focus, how it's too far out of focus, then you refocus. As we've already seen, counterintuitively, if I focus on the woman in the front row and I change my mind when I focus on the exit sign, I have to pull the lens toward me. That reduces this, uh, the magnification. And it reduces by a quantifiable amount that I can calculate. We fill this in. Do it again, we fill that in. And we have the entire painting. If I had a ruler, I could make this quantitative. I have the woman. The distance across her shoulders in the painting is 10 inches. The distance across a real woman's shoulders is 18 inches. I know this because I have a wife and two daughters. And in the land of the data list, the man with two data points is king. So I've got the data points. I know the magnification of the painting. It's 0.56. That tells me how far apart these triangles are. And instead of this thing going out of focus five to nine repeat distances in, tells me in real units of centimeters, and I can calculate things from this now. So I have these two equations of geometrical optics. I have a magnification, the depth of field that I've just measured. So I end up with six equations and seven unknowns. Ooh, what does that mean? This is it. That moment they told us about in high school where one day algebra would save our lives. Six equations, seven unknowns. If I make one assumption, everything else follows. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that I'm roughly four feet from the carpet, and I've got error bars on it, and I won't go into all that. Everything else follows from this. I have no control over what goes on. Geometrical optics dictates that if, if Lorenzo Lotto used a lens, there have to be three regions with three different sets of magnifications. And let's see how well it fits. If I look at the distance from that kink across... After refocusing, that distance decreased. And it decreased by 13.1%. Algebra tells me it should have decreased by 12.6%. It agrees to a half a percent accuracy. Here, different magnification change. Again, it agrees to a half a percent mag uh, accuracy. So did Lorenzo Lotto use a lens? Of course he did. There's no other way. We're not saying that optics is the only way to get perspective right. We're seeing optics is the only way to get perspective wrong in exactly the way these artists got perspective wrong. And I'm going to just skip over this. There's other ways of getting perspective right. Let me just skip past this. So a summary of evidence, and again, I encourage you to go to my webpage and download all of this. The evidence that this Lorenzo Lotto painting 75 years before Van Eyck, uh, sorry, before uh, Galileo, overwhelming evidence.